Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to uh, today's uh, Zoom ac academic meeting of our Department of Pediatric Surgery. Um, and uh, today, Dr. Kerat Botha, who is our medical officer, he is going to talk about the role of nuclear medicine in pediatric surgery. And we are really happy and honored to have Dr. Anita Brink as our invited guest for today's talk. But I also see that there is Dr. Barbara Forster, who uh, is a nuclear medicine physician and uh, is uh, Margarita van Furen are also uh, joining. So Dr. Brink uh, did her MBCHB from University of Pretoria. Then she uh, did her specialization uh, as a nuclear physician in 2007. She completed her master's in nuclear medicine with distinction in 2010 and also PhD in nuclear medicine in 2020. So she is really well studied. Uh, she is the current head of the nuclear medicine department at the Red Cross Children's Hospital in Cape Town since 2009. She has published many articles and written chapter in a book and her main field of interest is pediatric renography. So Anita, uh, welcome as welcome to Barbara and Margarita. And I'll now ask Dr. Botha to, uh, to give his talk. Uh, so Kara, you can start. I will stop. Uh, yeah, I've stopped sharing. You can start sharing. Thank you very much, Prof. Just want to adjust. There we go. Good afternoon, colleagues and guests. Um, my topic for today is mentioned by Prof is the role of nuclear medicine in pediatric surgery. So Nuclear medicine is both a diagnostic as well as a therapeutic field. I'll try to give a brief overview of five of the more commonly performed nuclear medicine scans applicable to us. And it's important to think of these nuclear medicine scans as functional imaging, um, rather as the structural imaging that we are used to, things such as ultrasounds or x-rays. It's of note that these scans do take a while to perform, but very rarely general anesthesia or sedation may be needed, as I heard that the nuclear medicine doctors have all learned how to entertain children with DVDs, etc., and that's something one should remember. Um, the radiation dose given to these children is as low as reasonably achievable. Um, the dose given by most nuclear medicine scans is actually quite low, especially if one considers that the general population of the United Kingdom re receives about 2.7 millisievert of uh, background radi radiation. But most nuclear medicine scans give as little as um, well below one millisievert. So how are these scans done? First, the patient is injected with a radiopharmaceutical, uh, the radioactive tracer. This tracer gets taken up, depending on the tracer where it gets taken up, and gamma rays are emitted by it. These gamma rays are then captured by a gamma camera, which is also a quite interesting piece of equipment. And then an image is produced, which is interpreted by specialists such as Dr. Brim. The first scan I'll talk about is the DMSA scan. It uses dimercaptosicinic acid, please excuse my pronunciation, um, in assessing renal morphology, structure, and function. The radio tracer is taken up by the proximal renal tubules, and only a relatively small portion is excreted via the urinary system. The rest remain in the proximal renal tubules and renal parenchyma. Imaging can be carried out um, about two to four hours after tracer injection, and the effective dose equivalent of radiation is 0.6 to 0.8 millisievert. The DMSA scan is the current gold standard used to assess um, the integrity of the renal parenchyma, the contribution of each kidney to the total renal parenchymal function, and is a highly sensitive scan used for the identification of um, renal scars. Some of its uses in pediatric nephrology include following a UTI to look for any pyelonephritis. This is done in the acute setting and has a 90% sensitivity for the diagnosis of pyelonephritis. It's also done at four to six months after UTI if renal scarring is suspected. This is important as patients with renal scarring at a, are at a higher risk of hypertension as well as chronic kidney disease. 
The above DMSA scan is of a seven-year-old with a history of recurrent UTI, bladder dysfunction, and vesicourotic reflux. In the scan, the right kidney has a normal appearance, and the left kidney has reduced trace uptake with multiple renal scars. In the initial scan, scan A, the left kidney contributes only 26% of the total renal function. And then in image B done four years later, it shows further deterioration of the left kidney with more extensive scarring. And this time it's only contributing 14% of the total glomerular filtration rate. The MAG3 scan uses TC99 mercaptoacetyl triglycine. Um, it's also used to assess renal perfusion, renal parenchymal function, but with a bonus of looking at the renal um, collecting system and ureters. During the MAG3 scan, a patient lies supine on a gamma couch with a gamma camera looking at them to obtain a dynamic image. Um, the image is recorded immediately after injection until 20 or 40 minutes after. The effective dose equivalent is um, lower than that of the DMSA with 0.3 to 0.7 millisecond. MAG3 scans are used to evaluate for the presence of vesicourotic reflux, look for suspected PUJ or VUJ, pelvic junction or vesicourotic junction obstruction. At six to nine months following surgery, such as pyeloplasty, to assess the outcome of the surgery and to confirm the diagnosis of a duplex renal collecting system. The above MAG3 renogram is that of a three-month-old male with um, antenatally diagnosed severe right hydronephrosis. It shows a tilted right kidney due to the very large extra renal pelvis, a slightly reduced tracer uptake within the right renal parenchyma, and the right kidney contributes 40% of the total renal function of this image. Very slow drainage from the right um, renal collecting system with hold up at the level of the PUJ is demonstrated. And this last image is the post micturation view that demonstrates persistent urinary stasis of the right renal pelvis at the level of the PUJ. The findings of this scan were in keeping with that of PUJ abnormality and the patient uh, pyeloplasty was done. So as demonstrated, the DMSA scan and the MAG3 scan are very similar in some aspects, but with some key differences. So like a DMSA scan, a MAG3 scan gets taken, the radio trace gets taken up by the proximal renal tubules. But unlike with the DMSA scan, it does not stay in the proximal renal um, parenchyma and is excreted into the tubular lumen. This leads to draining into the renal collecting system via the bladder, via both ureters. So why would one do a DMSA scan um, if, and why would it be the gold standard if a MAG3 scan has a lower effective dose equivalent of radiation, is quicker to do, and in most cases, the renal function evaluation calculated by doing a MAG3 scan is adequate? Well, there are some exceptions to the adequacy of a MAG3 scan. Um, these are in patients with grossly enlarged kidneys, Conditions with poor parenchymal excretion or high background activity, things such as immature kidneys or severe chronic kidney disease. The MIBG scan uses meta holo benzyl guanine um, I123. Um, it's an analog for norepinephrine nor and gets taken up by the presynaptic cells of the sym sympathetic nerve fibers. Um, one important note that will be told to us when we book one of these is that prior to MIGB scan, medications such as libitolol or some decongestion should be stopped as they can interfere with the trace uptake. So let's say you're managing a patient with a neuroblastic tumor. How can this scan be used to help you and why does it form such a cornerstone of the management of these patients? Well, these scans can tell us if, if there are any metastases, either local or distant. Um, they can tell us which stage the disease is, where should a biopsy be done, what was the response to treatment, as well as if there's any residual disease or any recurrence following treatment. This image shows the MIGB scan of a four-year-old female patient with a right suprarenal mass lesion who also had raised urinary catecholamines. A diagnosis of poorly differentiated neuroblastoma was made on biopsy. Um, the MIBG staging scan 
shows tracer uptake within the primary tumor in the left suprarenal region, as well as widespread skeletal metastasis. This patient was treated with an aggressive chemotherapy regime and received and achieved complete remission um, of the metastatic lesions. The primary neuroblastoma was also completely excised. The next scan is the HIDA scan. It uses TC99M mebrofinin. It's used to look at problems of the liver, gallbladder, as well as the bile ducts. One of the things to note is that the patients can be pre-treated with phenobarbital um, for three to five days prior to um, the scan, as this increases tracer uptake and uh, increases tracer secretion from the hepatocytes, which increases the sensitivity of the test. It can be used to look for gallbladder information, such as seen with cholecystitis, congenital abnormalities of the bile ducts, such as biliary atresia or something like not as congenital, but neonatal hepatitis. Also looking for um, post-operative complications such as bile leaks or fistulas, and in the assessment of patients for liver transplant. After administering the radio tracer it gets taken up by the liver parenchyma. If there's good tracer uptake, but no excretion into the bowel, this is suggestive of either biliary atresia or more commonly severe neonatal hepatitis. However, it can be used to exclude, exclude biliary atresia if the trace isn't seen in the intestines. If there's poor tracer uptake, this is in keeping with the petrocellular damage. Thus, this can be used as a simple, safe, and cost-effective investigation for investigation getting a patient with suspected biliary atresia um, in the first six to eight weeks of life before biliary cirrhosis sets in. However, it's of note that for the definitive diagnosis of biliary atresia, transhepatic cholangiography is still required. This HIDA scan shows the serial images done at 15, 30, 45 minutes, and then hourly for three hours, as no radio tracer was seen um, in the bowel till three hours. Another delayed scan was done at 24 hours. This scan is considered positive for suggestive of biliary atresia, um, as there's a good liver uptake with no intestinal activity till 24 hours after. The last scan I will talk about is the Meckel scan. Sorry about that. The Meckel scan uses TC99. Oh, I just lost the connection there for a moment, Prof. No problem. Oh, it should be back now. Yeah, it's back. No problem. Go ahead. Um, so the Meckel scan uses technetium 99 permanganate as a simple way of diagnosing a Meckel diverticulum. Normally, these are in patients that present with gastrointestinal bleeding. The specificity of the scan is approximately 95%, and the sensitivity is approximately 60%. Um, for the scan, the patient re receives pre-treatment with proton pump inhibitors. These are to prevent passage of the tracer from the stomach to the duodenum. They are also asked to be fasting for a period of um, four hours. Imaging starts immediately and is continued at one minute per frame for 30 minutes, and results can appear as quick as 15 minutes into the study. But why would we use a Meckel scan and not just what we have? Well. A barium meal has been shown that it really reflux contrasts into the diverticulum. A laparoscopy or explorative laparotomy are both quite invasive procedures in comparison to a Meckel scan, and capsule endoscopy is not available in our setting yet. This is just a picture of a Meckel scan with the clearly visible Meckel diverticulum there. And a brief conclusion is that nuclear medicine scans are a functional form of imaging. We are very used to structural imaging and thus should just think about them a little bit differently. It's a highly specialized field and this isn't even scratching the iceberg. Um, there are more than 200 different types of nuclear medicine scans available. It's in 
important to assess your patients and prepare them prior to them going for the scan. The DMSA scan and MAG3 scan are very similar, but still quite different in what they can tell us. Our MIGP is the cornerstone of our management of patients with neuroblastic tumors, and a HIDA scan can be used to rule out bilirectresia. However, not to confirm. These are just some of the references that I've used, and special thanks to Prof and Dr. Brink. Kerry, uh, thank you very much. That was a very nice summary. And uh, as, as you said, that this is a very vast field. I mean, there is a full specialization uh, in this field. So we decided to restrict to the most commonly used nuclear medicine scans, mm -hmm. and uh, you did well. Just a very few, uh, probably minor corrections, is that I think I123 is not iron, but it's iodine, iodine 123. And I think it is MIBG, but I'm due for correction. And it's not transhepatic cholangiography, which is the gold standard for biliary atresia. It's the intraoperative uh, cholangiography, which, which we do. And I think the spelling of the word technate, I'm, I'm being a bit fussy. Uh, it's not technate, I think it is technate. But otherwise, Kerry, you really did well. Thank you very much. So I'll invite Dr. Brink now to give her advice and, and tell us a bit more how the importance of, uh, what is the importance and relevance of nuclear medicine for pediatric surgeons. So can you, can, yeah, thank you. Okay, so I just wanna start off by saying to Hari, um, Dr. Guita, wow trying to say all those big names. Congratulations, I gave up after a month. So please don't worry about that. So nuclear medicine is a functional imaging um, speciality and how I always explain it is, it's not how you look, but how hard you work. Not interested in looks, only function. So in this talk, I'm gonna cover the same things as um, Dr. Bueta did, DMSA, MAG3, I'm going to touch a little bit on indirect cystography because it's a freebie. And then we're going to talk a little bit about Meckel's hepatobiliary studies and MIBG studies as well. So firstly, these are just images of patients on our camera. You can see this little man is lying on the camera, mom sitting next to him, and he's strapped onto the bed to help him lie still. And on our newer camera, you'll see that there's a lot of toys. We actually have a TV in the room that the babies can lie on the bed and watch TV. It works like magic, like a TV or screen or does on all children. So see, since we've got the screen in the department, the number of screaming children has decreased significantly and the number of movement artifacts has also decreased. And we really only sedate about one, in, one child in six months. Very rarely that we do sedate. So when we get to DMSA, Dr. Bueta did talk about this. DMSA is taken up by the proximal convoluted tubule and most of it stays inside the kidney and only a small amount is excreted up to 10% by six hours. But because of that small amount of urinary excretion, it does tend to overestimate the function in hydronephrotic kidneys. So a normal DMSA scan, we, you only see the cortex, you don't see the collecting system and it's considered the gold standard for detecting cortical defects. So you. DMSA scans is good for detecting cortical defects and calculating differential renal function. We also use DMSA scans to find what I call the missing kidney. This is just an example of a crossed fused ectopic kidney. And obviously you can use DMSA to look for cortical defects. The problem with a DMSA scan for me, and, and this is something in the South African setting. We're not in Europe, we're in South Africa. And the recommendation for doing DMSA scans is about six months after the last UTI. So for most children, they are healthy and they don't come back for the follow-up scan. That's number one. Number two, the popularity of DMSA scans have decreased significantly since the new NICE guidelines have come out. And now renal imaging for cortical scars is limited to children with recurrent infections and children with atypical in infections, essentially. So, um, and as I say, you have to do the DMSA scan six months after the infection because those cortical defects can still improve as time goes along. So um, 
I personally love MAG3. I think I love MAG3 more than I love my husband. Don't tell him that. But MAG3 gives us a lot of information. It gives us the differential renal function. In the majority of children, it's equal to DMSA. It also, you can use it to look for the cortical defects and you can also give you additional information, which I'm gonna show you now. So this is an example of a MAG3 scan versus a DMSA scan. This is a dynamic scan and you can see the perfusion. Just give it the video a little bit of time. You can see uptake and excretion of MAG3 into the collecting system. So it's more than just the kidney, it gives you a lot of additional information. So we use MAG3 predominantly to evaluate PUJ obstruction, vesicoureteric reflux, and posterior urethral valves and duplex kidneys. And we also help use MAG3 if we're looking for that missing kidney, that multicystic dysplastic kidney or the ectopic kidney. It's just one easy way to find that kidney that you can't see on ultrasound. So I'm just gonna go through a couple of cases to give you an idea of what MAG3 is about. So we image from posterior. This is the left kidney, that is the right kidney. And you can see that that right kidney looks hydronephrotic. So as the study progresses, these are all one minute of frame images. You will see that there's activity accumulating in the collecting system. And by 20 minutes, there's a lot of urine in both kidneys. Then we give Lasix and you will see the moment we give Lasix, both kidneys clear. And if you think about children with PUJ obstruction, hydronephrosis, only 10% of them actually need surgery. The rest of them can be observed conservatively and followed up conservatively. So this scan helps us to decide, look, these kidneys just look big, but they're not obstructed. They're clearly draining after we give Lasix. So if you look here, you'll see that the right kidney is contributing 43% of the function. And if you look at the green curve, this is the curve of that right kidney there's increased activity in that curve until we give Lasix and whoops, then everything clears out of that kidney. So this is just a, the majority of renograms that I do, we can exclude obstruction fairly safely if there's good clearance. So this is just a second case to give you a little bit of a different perspective on MAC3 renography. So this little boy presented when he was, um, I think 12 months old, and you can see that left kidney looks hydronephrotic, but there's good uptake and there's good clearance into the collecting system. And the right kidney clears beautifully. The left kidney has some holdup, but when the patient passes urine, there is a decrease. And he was also upright and we changed his nappy. And after he passed urine, you will see that there was a further decrease in activity in that left kidney. So at this stage, we said the kidney was not obstructed. So the function of that left kidney was 52%. So he was lost to follow up and he came back with an increasing AP pelvis. And on the follow up scan, you'll see that that left kidney now looks bigger and the drainage is poorer and there's a decrease in function. And this is actually an indication for surgery and he went on to have surgery and a pyloplasty. Finally, this is my last case, and this is where the field of nuclear medicine is moving, and we're very excited about what I'm going to show you now. So this is a patient with a 13-year-old with flank pain. So he already has an indication for surgery just on the basis that he's got flank pain with his hydronephrosis. But you'll see that there's decreased activity and in that right kidney compared to the left. And very quick clearance of activity from the collecting, from the cortex on the left into the collecting system. So you see good collecting system accumulation on the left, but on the right, the activity hangs around in the cortex. Now this is a warning that this kidney is truly obstructed and there was no Lasix response. And the function of that right kidney was 27%. So on this scan, we could predict that this kidney was obstructed on a single renogram and he went on to have his pyloplasty. And this is the follow-up images where you can see the kidneys are now similar in uptake. And the function went from 26% on the left to 47%, a 20% increase because of the, the fact that we relieved that obstruction. So very satisfying to do these studies. Now we get to the piece, the resistance of MAG3. If you do your MAG3 renogram 
and it's a normal kidney, you'll see that all of the tracer clears into the bladder. So at the end of your 40 minute study, you have activity in the bladder without using a catheter. That's why it's called an indirect cystogram. What you do then is you ask the patient to pass urine. And if you're lucky, you'll see the reflux without ever using a catheter. So in this case showing you here, we don't have any functioning tissue on the left. And as the child passes urine, it refluxes into the left. So we've answered a couple of questions. Non-functioning left kidney, clear reflux, one-stop shop. Love this. So now we're finishing with the renal imaging. Now we get to Meckel's. And I don't have to tell you this background, but a Meckel's diverticulum is essentially a vestigial remnant of the mesenteric duct. It occurs in one to 3% of the population. It's asymptomatic in the majority of the patient. Complications usually occur before two years of life. And 20 to 57%, you can't get references that agree on this value, contains topic gastric mucosa. This is very important because a Meckel scan is actually not a Meckel scan, it's a misnomer. It's a scan looking for topic gastric mucosa. So I will have a completely normal scan if the Meckel diverticulum contains tissue other than um, ectopic gastric mucosa. So keep that in mind. If my scan is normal and you find the Meckels at surgery, don't come and bite me. <laughs> so, sodium perchlorate, a so sodium pertechnitate is taken up by the stomach the same way as um, um, chloride, okay, or iodine. So what we do is we inject pertechnitate and at the same time as you see the stomach, you usually see the Meckel's diverticulum in a topic position. And then if the stomach starts to secrete, the Meckel's can also secrete. So it's the activity of ectopic gastric mucosa or activity that appears approximately at the same time as the stomach and behaves in a similar fashion to the stomach. This is just an example from our department. Um, this is heart, liver, spleen, and about image two to three minutes after injection, you start seeing the outline of the gastric mucosa. And you start seeing this little dot here. And as the study progresses, that little dot becomes more intense. And this was confirmed at surgery to be a ectopic gastric mucosa on Meckel's. So what is the recent research on Meckel's scans? At Great Ormond Street, they looked at data recorded over 18 years, 183 patients. There were two groups. The one group had um, painless bleeding per rectum, and the second group had non-specific symptoms, abdominal pain with or without nausea, and all of these patients had Meckel's scans. Of the guys with painless, painless bleeding per rectum, 26% had a positive Meckel scan, and of those with the non-specific symptoms, only 2% had a positive Meckel scan. And then of the positive Meckel scan, 17 were found to be true positives at surgery. There were five false positives, including a um, small bowel Meckel's diverticulum. Don't know how that happened. And there were only one false negative. So the overall sensitivity was 94% and the specificity was 97%. So Meckel's diverticulum remains a high diagnostic accuracy, but in the setting of painless bleeding per rectum, especially if the HB block um, drops, it's not really indicated for patients with vague symptoms like abdominal pain or nausea. They are better served with having the endoscopy in the first place. Now we get to biliary presia. So um, this study published in 2013 looked at a meta-analysis of 81 studies and found that biliary atresia studies using um, mebrofenin had an overall sensitivity of 89% and a specificity of 70%. So we're very good at excluding a um, biliary atresia. We're not very good at diagnosing a biliary atresia and I'll explain to you why. So you can use a number of different traces. We like using mebrofenin and mebrofenin is pretty much replaced HIDA and um, decider. You can pre-medicate. Um, Dr. Buita said you can pre-meditate with phenobob, which makes the babies very sleepy and is quite 
a lot of side effects. So we have moved to use um, uruso deoxycholic acid for two to three days beforehand with far less side effects. You also really, you can get away with not pre-medicating it. Pre-medication is like an optional extra, but without it, you still have very good, I mean, 70, 68 versus 72 percent difference in sensitivity is not that much for me, but in any case. So we give uruso deoxycholic acid at Red Cross and we give it for two days before the scan. And this is just an example of the scan that we did this Friday where you can see the injection site, the heart and liver. And as the study progresses about 10 minutes into the scan, you really don't have a lot of heart activity anymore in ke keeping with good uptake. And you see the liver with no excretion into the um, bowel. So the purpose of the scan, when I, if I have 100 scans like this, only about 30 of them will end up actually having biliary atresia. So most of these will still be neonatal hepatitis. The, the usefulness of the scan is, however, if I do see excretion, we can confidently say the patient does not have biliary atresia and we can stop investigating. So it's a diagnosis of exclusion and not a diagnosis of inclu inclusion. Now we move on to MIBG. MIBG is used for the staging and follow-up of neuroblastoma, also in the setting of spontaneous pheochromosotomas where they're very useful. And this is just an example of a normal MIBG scan where we've got salivary gland uptake, some nasal activity, heart, liver, and renal excretion. I want you to carefully see that you do not see any skeletal uptake. There is nothing, no uptake in normal marrow, no uptake in skeleton. And that is the strength of the MIBG scan because of the fact that there normally isn't any uptake in the skeleton. You can see easily detect skeletal as well as bone marrow metastases. As you can clearly see, the scan actually looks like a bone scan. Unfortunately, this was an MIBG scan in a patient who later demised from the disease. Um, you will find in the reports that we talk about the modified Curie score. It's just a number that we use for risk stratification and we actually assign a score to each segment in the body. And um, the, the baseline score doesn't really have any clinical impact. But if your score at the end of four cycles or seven cycles is of chemotherapy is more than two, essentially if you've got more than one lesion still taking up MIBG outside of the tumor, then you've got a very poor prognosis compared to those with a complete response to therapy. So that was a very quick rundown of pediatric nuclear medicine in the pediatric surgery field from my side. Are there any questions? Uh, Anita, th thank you very much. Uh, that, that was quite informative and, and uh, educational. Kerry, my apologies. Your spelling of the word technetate is correct. I was wrong. So, so it's not easy to remember all these names. I know that's perfect. Um, I think what I can probably do is to ask uh, Barbara Forster um, to comment if she has uh, any comments because she used to um, report on our scans for many years. Uh, so Barbara, uh, any comments on, on, on the topic uh, or anything you would like to add or emphasize? Barbara, can you unmute yourself? Prof, I think Mahrita is going to say something. Okay, Mahrita. Right. So Please. I'm... Are you Barbara? Is she there? Yes, yes, Barbara. Sorry. Sorry, I'm on my way back from Kimberley, so I'm in the car. It's actually quite noisy. Um, okay. I, I don't, I, perhaps, Mahrita, would you mind answering the question? No problem. No problem. Margarita, you can give your comments. You can. Okay, thank you. Um, Anita and um, Dr. Berger, thank you. That was really informative and you covered almost everything that we do on a daily basis. Unfortunately, it could be used much more, especially the renograms um, with a baseline um, scan always mean so much. Just 
just to go, I have something available to compare it afterwards and for follow up. And um, it's, it must be highlighted much more out there to use the MAC3 scans for the children. Thank you, Margarita. And uh, I fully uh, agree with you, as I agree with uh, Anita as well, and my colleague consultants will also agree. We also use DMSS scan very infrequently. I actually don't remember mm -hmm. requesting a DMSS scan because as you correctly said, I think MAC3 scan gives almost all the information which DMSS scan used to give and uh, much more. So I think we uh, have mentioned DMSA because it is still there in the books. Secondly, I think we need to start using uh, uh, nuclear histography um, much, much uh, more than what we are currently using. Um, I think we will discuss amongst ourselves as consultants and, and we will start using that bit more often. And coming to your comment, Margarita, um, I think we need to educate uh, pediatricians uh, bit much more about the use of these scans. Just a quick example. Uh, I know of, uh, of an infant who is about six months old now. The child has some cysts in one kidney and pediatrician has been observing those cysts from prenatal period. And they have been doing repeated ultrasounds every three months but at six months of age, have not asked for a nuclear medicine scan and only plan to ask for a nuclear medicine scan at 10 months of age. I didn't say anything because it was not my patient, but this just shows how uh, the, the knowledge um, about the availability and the utility of nuclear medicine scan is still lacking. Um, but we, we are quite blessed even though we uh, did not have the service within the hospital. Um, I think it was taken away by year 2000. We still had the service available. And I think most important thing which I have been telling all juniors is to write adequate clinical information as much as possible on the request form. Um, so the more the information, the better it is for Dr. Brink or Dr. Margarita or whosoever is the specialist who is going to report on that scan. So I think uh, th those are the things which, uh, which come to my mind. Um, I will now invite uh, Prof Hadley to make any comments, Prof. Uh, thanks, Melinda. Um, I'd just like to thank all the speakers uh, this afternoon. Uh, I'm hugely informative talks. Thank you very much. It, it is, as you know, many years since I've played this game. And uh, when last I was uh, on the scene, the problem was availability of the isotopes. And uh, we often had to wait sometimes weeks for, for example, MIBG to, uh, to be delivered. Uh, and sometimes it just wasn't available at all. And I, I'd be interested to know, I've, I've always been critical of the HIDA scan. I'm, I'm not at all sure what a HIDA scan can tell me that I can't learn by looking in the nappy. Um, and, uh, <laughs> Uh, re really, it, does it still have a place in our, our armamentarium? Prof, I think in, in Red Cross, we very infrequently do the HIDAR scan. Mm. Um, we've, we've been joking that a bread knife and a, a plate with a stool in the window gives you far better information for far cheaper. So... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And, and what happened is we used to do quite a lot of them and then we ran out of in, into issues with availability of the mibrofenin and, and we went back to the old fashioned using a, literally cutting open stool and leaving it in the sun and it, it's very useful. <laughs> yeah, so, no, I mean, yeah, I mean our, so, our pediatricians used to wait weeks for mm -hmm. a HIDA scan. Um, by which time the child had acquired cirrhosis and uh, made our lives infinitely more difficult. Um, whereas, you know, a, a, a rectal examination would certainly have excluded biliary atresia um, with as much confidence as, as a HIDA scan would. And I think that the people doing ultrasounds here are also a clinical investigation has is just far better than um, mm. even ultrasound is the feeling at Red Cross. I know the literature says differently, but 
-hmm. on the ground. I agree mm -hmm. with you, Paul. Yeah. Yeah. May I just say something about the indirect cystogram? Yes, with the indirect yes. cystogram, you have to be toilet trained. Mm -hmm. So it's usually useful for children over than, older than three. We cannot grade the reflux such as grade one, two, three, or four. Mm -hmm. We'll only be able to tell you whether or not the reflux reaches the kidney. But in any case, that is, re that is grade three reflux, which is clinically significant. Mm -hmm. We're not worried about grade one or two in any case. Mm. And then another comment, just one last one, please. Yes, please. If you write your detailed clinical history for me on the request form, please don't use abbreviations. <laughs> I don't know all the abbreviations. That's <laughs> yes, very true. Yes. Um, okay, no, that's very good. Okay, now I'm, I'm very glad that both Prof Hadley and uh, Dr. Brink have um, emphasized that uh, we, including pediatricians, must not lose days, I'm not even saying waste days, in investigating a child with obstructive jaundice um, at all. So, so because the, the appointment can only uh, be uh, there in two weeks time, we cannot wait for a HIDA scan or, or, a, or a liver scan for to rule out biliary atresia. So rather than that, ultrasound, stool examination, ultrasound, and better go for operative cholangiography. We also use HIDA scan very, very infrequently. I think recently we had a premature newborn who was very tiny, was probably like one kilogram or so. And we were really wondering whether we should be considering operation at that age. And in that child, we got a HIDA scan done. So I think it's very important that you have highlighted uh, that we should not wait for HIDA scan. Um, thank you. Now I'll invite uh, our consultants to comment. I'll first invite Dr. Selo Machaya, who is our consultant pediatric surgeon with special interest in hepatobiliary surgery. Selo, any comments? Uh, thanks, Prof. Uh, thanks, uh, Gerard. Very good, informative talk, and thanks to the guests as well. Um, yeah, I think um, with knowing um, which test to use when um, plays an important part because if you don't know, there's something called a MAC3, you'll never use it. You'll just keep using ultrasounds and ultrasounds and CT scans and IVPs and think we're doing adult um, urology. Um, they have a role to play, yes, but um, knowing that the other um, more um, informative uh, tests out there is very important. And I think uh, this kind of platform just highlights that um, or makes us aware that there are other things out there which we can use in uh, our day-to-day -day running in peep surgery. But otherwise, uh, thanks again, uh, Herat, and thanks, Bob. Yes, th thank you, Selo. And I think uh, another important thing is, uh, I think discussion with the nuclear physician. If there's any complicated case, in addition to uh, writing proper clinical history and background, I think it always helps to give a personal phone call and tell them what you are looking for. I think it just adds to, to uh, their output about the study. I'll now invite Dr. Yashoda Manikchan, who is consultant pediatric surgeon. Yashoda, any comments on the topic? Hi, Prof. Uh, yes, thanks. Thanks, everyone, for that talk. It was it was really good, and it cleared up a lot of um, indications for these nuclear medicine scans. I just want to say how fortunate we are to have these tests. I mean, the renogram, uh, the MAG-3 renogram is invaluable in our management of PUJO, but, uh, yeah, pelvic junction obstruction. So, uh, to assess, you know, to assess the function and to decide on surgery. So it really is invaluable. And then just another comment is we also would use a urinogram if we were doing nephron sparing surgery. And I just wanted to ask Anita, which one do they do? So pro probably the DMSA because they're looking at the cortex when they're doing nephron sparing surgery. When we're doing nephron sparing surgery, we do DMSA scans because um, the renal tissue is displaced by the tumors anteriorly. And for those tumors, I do anterior and posterior images to see where the tumor is. Um, so then the DMSA is better. And if we can even add on a little bit of a spec CT to help you 
localize the tumors better on the CT component compared to functioning um, renal tissue if that will help you plan your surgery. But MAG3 is not really useful in that setting, then you will use your DMSA. Yeah, sure. Okay, thanks. Um, we will get there eventually. <laughs> And then the other thing is the octreotide scan. We sometimes use those for uh, gastronoma. If we have a child who has um, recurrent episodes of, of um, gastritis. Um, yeah, but thank you everybody. And I feel very fortunate that we have these tests to help us. Yes, thank you Yashoda. I fully agree with you that uh, th those of us who know about uh, conditions uh, and facilities in in uh, rest of the African countries. We just need to remember that we have easy access. Nobody asks us any questions about uh, get, getting these tests done. So we are really fortunate. Um, I will now invite Dr. Majola, who is also a consultant pediatric surgeon to make any comments. Uh, Dr. Majola. Thanks, Prof. Uh, thanks, Herod, for your talk and also to the commenters uh, for their contribution. I don't have any comments, Prof. Thank you, Dr. Majola. I see Liza is also here. Liza, do you want to make any practical comment? Any difficulties you face or anything you would like to, to say? Liza is a nuclear medicine technician who works with East Coast Radiology. Liza? Maybe Liza is not able to hear me. Liza? No, she's not here. Okay, I will now request uh, Dr. Brink to maybe just give a final concluding remarks and then we can close the meeting. It was very informative. It was really short and sweet, but uh, we really uh, touched on the important uh, aspects of nuclear medicine. So Anita, final words from you. Thank you very much for inviting me. Remember, we're just a phone call away. If there's any questions or any patient that you think you, we might help, just pick up the phone and ask us, really. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so, uh, Margarita, any final comments? Yes, I would also just like to thank Dr. Anita. She's always available whenever we struggle or me or Barbara, we like to call her. And, um, and thank you for you for um, organizing this. And we hope that we can hear from you more. And um, you could see that me and Anita were smiling when you spoke about the clinical info. It will really, really make a big difference in all the nuclear medicine scans. Clinical info helps us. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Kerry, for a nice presentation. Anita, Margarita, for, for your uh, expert opinion and advice. And Prof. Hadley, as usual, um, uh, next week. Uh, we, uh, Dr. Uh, Jula, our registrar, will talk about um, controversies in the classification and management of appendicitis. What does the evidence say? And Professor Sharif Emil from Ontario, Canada, will be our invited guest. So thank you, everyone. Have a good evening. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.